from government. Truth, com Truth commissions, exile, indefinite detention, and lethal force. So in many ways, discussing atrocity prevention generally and Syria specifically amid the coronavirus pandemic is particularly appropriate. More than 6 million people have been internally displaced in Syria, and another 5 million are refugees that have fled to other countries. Refugees are particularly vulnerable to viruses, including the coronavirus. They often lack access to hand-washing facilities, let alone robust healthcare infrastructure, all while being packed into dense living quarters. One silver lining about transitional justice for atrocity crimes committed in Syria is that the conflict is widely regarded to be the most documented in history. As such, there is and will be abundant evidence, including documents, photos, videos, testimonies, and artifacts available for transitional justice mechanisms, provided that the evidence can be authenticated and its chain of custody can be established. Serious challenges to transitional justice in and for Syria include first, the conflict is ongoing. Until the Assad regime falls, transitional justice within Syria will realistically be non-existent. Second, Russia has committed some of the atrocity crimes. Given Russia's position as a veto-wielding permanent member of the UN Security Council, efforts through the Security Council to address the atrocity crimes will be limited or blocked entirely. Third, there has been an enormous number of crimes and victims. Accountability mechanisms are thus unlikely to be able to address all offenses, potentially leaving some survivors unsatisfied and some suspects unaddressed. And finally, many survivors and some suspected perpetrators have fled to other countries. Apprehending suspects as well as collecting testimonies and other evidence may thus be difficult. So today what I'm gonna do is uh, first discuss the um, pre-enactment uh, approach that the US government has taken to atrocity prevention um, throughout history before the two laws that will be the focus of this talk today, the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act and the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act. So I'll discuss law, law norms, conceptualizations, uh, and infrastructure all on atrocity prevention. Then I'll talk about uh, a little bit about how I became involved in enacting these two particular laws. Third, I'll give you an overview of these two laws. Fourth, I'll discuss their significance. Fifth, um, I'll uh, share some behind the scenes insights about uh, creating these laws. And then finally, I will acknowledge some criticisms uh, about the laws and provide some responses to them. So going uh, all the way back to 1948, um, that was the year, you know, soon after the Nuremberg Tribunals and uh, World War II and the Holocaust, that the Genocide Convention was uh, adopted. Now, it would be 40 more years until the United States government itself would ratify uh, this treaty. Um, but essentially what this treaty did was to commit its signatories to prevent and to punish specifically the crime of genocide. Uh, there was a bipartisan uh, resolution called the Proxmire Act um, in 1988 that was uh, the mechanism for the U.S. government's uh, ratification. Interestingly, the senator for whom the act is named, um, Senator William Proxmire, delivered 3,000, approximately 3,000 speeches on the Senate floor, basically one for every single day he served in the Senate, on why the Senate should ultimately adopt, um, ultimately ratify the, uh, the treaty, uh, which it did. And so the, the act is named uh, after him. And this was a bipartisan act. It was uh, firmly um, supported by uh, members of both sides of the aisle. Then fast forward to 2005, the UN General Assembly in that year unanimously adopted uh, the World Summit outcome. And one of the three of the provisions, one of the sections, um, of this outcome relates to the responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Um, this principle became known as the R2P, the responsibility to protect principle. And essentially what this did, um, and this is a, a resolution adopted by uh, the UN General Assembly, was to commit uh, its signatories, so because it was adopted unanimously, all members of the UN General Assembly, to protect populations from these named atrocity crimes. 
And so basically what's happened here is that you see an expansion essentially from the genocide convention from 1948, which focused just on genocide. So now a wider array of named atrocity crimes to include war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing um, as uh, meriting attention uh, from the international community. Um, within the United States government, let me take you through a quick timeline of its development of um, understanding and conceptualization of atrocity crimes and atrocity prevention. In 2002, we have uh, Samantha Power uh, publishing the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book, A Problem from Hell. Uh, then a few years later, uh, Secretary, former Secretary of State, who was a Democrat, uh, Madeleine Albright, and former Secretary of Defense, Bill Cohen, who was a Republican, um, joined together to publish a blueprint on atrocity prevention. And that's called preventing genocide, but it really applied to, to um, a wider array of atrocities. And then we have in, in quick succession, three initiatives of the Obama administration, which, which I'll discuss. So first, the, the Pulitzer Prize winning book, A Problem from Hell from Samantha Power, now of course, the USAID uh, administrator, former uh, permanent representative by, from the United States, the United Nations. Um, her book really calls attention to not only obviously the fact that there have been many atrocity crimes throughout history, but also the US government's um, inconsistent and insufficient um, uh, approach to addressing them. Um, often hypocritical, often um, uh, you know, just, just completely inconsistent. Uh, and so that, in, you know, the book rightly won the Pulitzer Prize for calling attention to such an enormously important topic. Then a few years later, the Albright Cohen report is released, um, very much inspired and informed by uh, Samantha Power's uh, book. And as you'll see, there's a, there's a few um, sort of pull quotes that I've, I've provided here. One is that it identifies genocide as threatening not only values, but also national interest. And this was a huge transformation in our conceptualization of atrocity prevention and atrocity crimes, that not only are they a moral issue, but they actually threaten uh, the US government and other nations in various ways. And so the report articulated some of those ways in which uh, they pose national security threats. Um, they exacerbate uh, related risks, they cause refugee and regional crises, and they compromise uh, US leadership. The first of the Obama administration initiatives on atrocity prevention um, was the Presidential Study Directive on, on Mass Atrocities. And as you, as you can see, this is just obviously inspired by the blueprint, the Albright Cohen report. Um, it, it identifies atrocity prevention as a core uh, national security interest and a core moral responsibility. Um, and I'll, you know, I just want to call your attention to the word core. Because of course there are many national security interests and there are many moral responsibilities, but it really elevated uh, through this presidential study directive, um, atrocity prevention to a high priority. Uh, and that's important when we're trying to distinguish how we should allocate resources and attention to various competing uh, interests. And then um, the presidential study directive also echoed the Albright Cohen report um, in articulating how atrocities threaten national security interests. The national security strategy in 2015, national security strategies incidentally are released by all presidential administrations. Um, and so the one in 2015 was the first to really identify atrocity prevention again as a core moral responsibility and a core national security uh, interest. And so it was echoing the language of the previous uh, Obama administration initiative. And then finally, the president issued an executive order um, that, uh, that directed that, that atrocity prevention is a core moral responsibility and a core national security. The other thing that these three initiatives did was to create what was called the Atrocities Prevention Board. Now, this was an interagency body that was established in the National Security Council within the White House to coordinate efforts all across the US government for addressing atrocity crimes. Previously, there were piecemeal efforts, whether in the State Department, in the Pentagon, elsewhere, um, that really weren't as uh, well coordinated. And that was one of the reasons that supposedly uh, the US government's uh, approach to addressing atrocity crimes in the past was not more successful and, and more effective. 
Um, I'm just going to um, briefly mention that there, starting in, in right after World War II, there, there really has been a growth in the infrastructure in the U.S. government for addressing atrocity crimes. We now find atrocity crime infrastructure and prevention in, infrastructure in most of the major agencies of the U.S. government. It started in the, the Treasury uh, Department with focusing on freezing assets of Nazis, but then it's progressed to the Department of Justice, the FBI, the State Department, USAID, the uh, Department of Homeland Security, the Pentagon, the intelligence community, and as I mentioned, in the White House with the Atrocities Prevention Board. So that brings us to, um, to my involvement. Uh, in 2016 to 2017, I was fortunate enough to receive uh, a fellowship from the Council on Foreign Relations uh, that's provided to certain academics to serve in the US government to apply their ideas. So I served on the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee during the first year of the Trump administration. I served on the Democratic side as divided into the Democrat and Republican sides. And on my first day of work, um, my boss sort of sat me down and said, we'd like you to try to implement your latest book, United States Law and Policy on Transitional Justice into two pieces of legislation, one sort of general um, and one that focuses specifically on Syria. And nobody uh, at that point had any hope that either of these two pieces of legislation would be enacted because President Trump, of course, had um, not a great reputation, to say the least, on human rights uh, issues. And so there was no thought um, that he would ultimately uh, sign such legislation. Both of the pieces of legislation were indeed um, signed into law, um, but uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So this is me delivering this, the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act to the Senate floor, um, and that was then uh, enacted. Um, the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act originally was drafted as a standalone piece of legislation, but then was ultimately incorporated into the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which was enacted in 2018. And so let me tell you just briefly what that, um, that law does. Um, first, it requires various uh, reporting on and technical assistance for uh, addressing atrocity crimes in, in Syria. And it does th so through various measures. It requires um, certain reporting from the Secretary of State on um, both the atrocity crimes that were being committed or are being committed in Syria, and also what effective transitional justice responses there could be. It then also authorizes the Secretary of State to provide technical assistance for addressing uh, those crimes. Um, fourth, it amends the State Department's Rewards for Justice program to explicitly refer to Syria. The, re the Rewards for Justice program is basically a bounty program, which offers millions of dollars to anyone um, who can provide information leading to the arrest or capture of certain named uh, suspected atrocity criminals. And then finally, it encourages the Secretary of State to use their influence at the United Nations to advocate that the UN Human Rights Council extend the mandate annually of the Syria Commission of Inquiry. Now, you may recall that the Trump administration withdrew from the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, and so this fifth um, aspect of the law actually became moot. That brings us to the more general Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act. Um, that, as you can see on, on the screen, um, became law in 2019. And so what this does is it, it um, announces, it articulates the US government's uh, view on atrocity prevention as being a, a national of national security and international security importance. Um, it amends the Foreign Service Act to add training for foreign service officers on atrocity crime identification and response. And that's important because foreign service officers, as you may know, um, are the sort of main career diplomats of the State Department. So they're out in the field um, and they're the, the eyes and the ears of what's going on on the ground in the, you know, every country in the world. Um, and so to train them, or at least certain ones um, who are uh, in areas that are at risk of atrocity crimes on uh, the theory and practice of atrocity prevention um, would be really helpful. And so now that is being done. And then, it, and then this law requires the president to submit reports about basically what the administration is doing on atrocity crimes. 
So what, what's the significance of these uh, two laws? I would say that there are, there are several. The first is, you know, this is really the first time that the legislative branch had identified atrocity prevention as in the national interest. Um, and that's hugely important because it's an acknowledgement that this is not just a moral concern, that this is um, in the national interest. This is of strategic uh, importance. The second is that these laws enshrined atrocity prevention and defined uh, transitional justice in U.S. law for the first time. So it's mainstreaming those two concepts. Um, third, the Atrocities Prevention Board for the first time is mentioned in a non-appropriations law. And so I think this really added a lot more credibility and support and legitimacy um, to this interagency body that had been created uh, during the Obama administration. Fourth, both of the laws promote international and domestic uh, cooperation on atrocity prevention in various ways. Uh, fifth, you know, the fact that both of them are widely um, supported by both Republicans and, and Democrats, I think really shows that, that Americans can still agree on certain basic principles relating to uh, human rights and international law. And I think that's really significant in our increasingly partisan era. Um, and then also, of course, they, the fact that they're so bipartisan, both of these laws really echoes, in my view, the bipartisan nature of both the Proxmire Act, which, as you recall, is the act that was named for Senator Proxmire to ratify the Genocide Convention, um, and also the Albright Cohen report uh, led by a former Democrat Secretary of State and a former Republican Depart uh, Secretary of Defense. Um, sixth, uh, they convey certain preferred transitional justice options of the U.S. government. So when I initially defined transitional justice, I mentioned that there are various tools for transitional justice that include amnesty and exile and lustration or purging from government and lots of things in addition to prosecution. But what these two laws do is they hone in on accountability as the, pr the preeminent uh, priority and also prosecution as the preferred tool. The US government has a, a long history of supporting all major transitional justice options, but what these two laws do, do is they hone in on one of them, prosecution. And then finally, um, the laws have inspired other countries to use them as models to incorporate their own similar laws. Um, and so that was very heartening. And, and the first country to do that was the UK. Now, let me just share with you a few war stories about um, getting these laws passed that some of them might surprise you. And some of them are also sort of counterintuitive. Um, the first is that um, going back to the first year of the Trump administration, you may recall that the, there was a lot of concern that the Trump administration, in part because they were saying it, um, was going to pare down the executive branch, was going to cut um, from existence certain offices in different departments. And so on the chopping block, on the supposed chopping block, were two uh, components uh, that are really essential to atrocity prevention and response. One is the Office of Global Criminal Justice and the State Department, and the other is the Atrocities Prevention Board that, the, that President Obama uh, created in the White House. Um, so what I did was I deliberately wrote into the laws reference to each of these entities. And my, my sort of theory was that if we can write into law a reference to these two entities, it helps support them. It helps bring attention to their importance and may help preserve them. And that is indeed what happened. Both of them were saved uh, and they continue to operate. The uh, Atrocities Prevention Board now operates under a different name, but the point is that both entities were preserved. Second, um, for those of you who have studied universal jurisdiction, this is a really controversial uh, doctrine that uh, essentially says that there are some crimes that are so egregious, so offensive to all of mankind, that wherever they are prosecuted or wherever they're perpetrated, they, they should be able to be prosecuted anywhere, regardless of where they're perpetrated. And this is really controversial um, for even, you know, Democrats and, and, and Republicans, as well as Republicans in the United States, um, for both principled and practical reasons. First of all, um, they're just jurisdictional, um, you know, disagreements about whether that's appropriate to do. And then secondly, there's a concern that this might negatively affect the United States. Um, the United States is, you know, deployed in, in more countries than, than any other country in the world. Um, and as you know, has been accused itself uh, of committing uh, various uh, heinous offenses. And so there's a concern that if you support a universal jurisdiction, 
um, that that may, may, may come back to haunt uh, the US government and US military. Um, so as this applies to these two laws, in the first draft of the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act, I referred to supporting third party uh, prosecutions. As I mentioned, there uh, some of the suspects of the atrocity crimes from Syria have fled to other countries. And so I wanted to support initiatives in those other countries to prosecute those individuals. So when I proposed this, when I shared this draft with my colleagues on the Republican side of the, um, of the committee, uh, they objected. They said, that, look, this is dead on arrival. We will never in a million years support universal jurisdiction. So I said, all right, fine. Um, let me give me 24 hours. Let me try to you know, come up with a compromise. So 24 hours later, I came back. I changed one word. I said, um, support uh, third party investigations rather than third party prosecutions. And everybody was happy. I was happy because investigations, of course, are the natural and necessary precursor to prosecutions. And then they were happy because it doesn't refer to prosecutions. So we were able to proceed. Third, um, there's no definition for crimes against humanity referred to in, the, um, in either law, though both laws refer to crimes against humanity as one of the atrocity crimes um, of concern. Um, and the reason is that while genocide and war crimes, the two other main categories of atrocity crimes are defined in the US code, crimes against humanity are not. And conservatives are particularly, Republicans are particularly opposed to referring to international law definitions in US legislation. So I could refer to the US code for genocide and war crimes, but there's nothing to refer to in US law for crimes against humanity. So we had the term, the compromise that we struck was we had the term stay in the law, but there's no definition of this term, which is, that's a problem. Um, fourth, you know, we might wonder why did President Trump sign? Um, and so I have two theories. One is that, uh, you know, neither law really obligates him to do or obligated him to do anything he, he opposed. Um, and so, you know, his interpretation, was, and this is in part through a, um, a letter that the Department of Justice and his administration sent to Congress, his interpretation is that the laws were merely suggestions. And because of the um, you know, sensitive separation of powers between the legislative and executive branch, particularly on foreign policy, um, you know, some of the, the words that are in the laws do appear as, as suggestions, like authorize. Authorize doesn't mean that you have to do something. It means we're, you know, you're able to do it. Um, and so, you know, basically the interpretation, I think, from the Trump administration was um, these are mere suggestions that we can take as we want uh, or not. Um, so that brings us, I think, to, to some potential criticisms that I think we need to um, acknowledge and then, and then consider what responses there, there might be to them. The first is, you know, are these laws, you know, meaningful at all? Um, we know that atrocity crimes continue the, the, you know, against the Uyghurs, the Rohingya, Afghanistan, you know, lots of places uh, in the world, um, Tigray. And, um, and it, you know, these laws are not necessarily changing, uh, obviously, anything. And so what I would say is, yes, that it's entirely fair that, that, um, that they may not have accomplished anything yet. But what I would say is that they do they do, do two things. Number one, they raise the cost of inaction. So now it's even harder for uh, the US government to justify not doing anything because now we have laws that compel uh, the US government to do so. And then the second is, um, you know, it, it, there is some power in symbolism. I mean, the United States government has committed itself to atrocity prevention through these two laws. Uh, and, um, and that is at least a symbolic achievement. Second, um, the, uh, the laws kind of watered down from the Obama administration's uh, conceptualization of the importance of atrocity prevention. You recall that I drew your attention to the fact that the, the Obama administration identified atrocity prevention as a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility. And as a compromise, the, these two laws strip out um, the word core. And that, as I'm, as, and, and also don't, don't even mention uh, a moral duty, just refer to it as a as national security uh, interest. 
Um, and so uh, this, this is a watering down, unfortunately, of, um, of the high point uh, of atrocity prevention conceptualization in the Obama administration. Third, neither law comes with its own funding. And so this has led to some people criticizing atrocity prevention or characterizing atrocity prevention as an unfunded mandate. The first uh, draft of the Elie Wiesel um, law uh, did include reference to um, supporting the complex crises fund, which can be used to support atrocity prevention work. But as part of the compromise process, that unfortunately was stripped out. So this is a legitimate uh, criticism. Uh, fourth, I already mentioned that crimes against humanity are not defined uh, in, in either of the laws. And that I think can lead to confusion. And then interestingly, can lead to the very thing that, um, that the opponents of including a definition uh, were concerned about, which is, you know, if this went to a court and you had to figure out a definition of crimes against humanity, you would have to cite foreign and international law. Um, fifth, you know, some concern about atrocity uh, prevention legislation is that it could prompt or, or would prompt military intervention. And so to, to address that concern uh, directly, um, the Elie Wiesel law features the sentence, nothing in this act shall be construed as authorizing the use of military force. Sixth um, is about the training of foreign service officers. I mentioned that certain foreign service officers receive training by law um, on atrocity prevention issues. Now, the problem with that is it leaves everybody else untrained. As I mentioned that there's now atrocity crime related infrastructure widely spread throughout the US government and appropriately so, I would think that we should train folks in lots of different entities, different uh, you know, corners of the US government. Um, and so my hope is that future uh, legislation will, will be directed at, at them. And then finally, there's concern that the reporting will be um, weak, well, won't be comprehensive, won't be timely, uh, and, um, and you know, will be, be totally ineffective. And, and that, is, that is a concern. The Trump administration's uh, first uh, report, which was in 2019, was late um, by many months. So it actually violated the law um, because the law is specific about when these reports are due. And it was... Um, it, it was very superficial. Uh, and so it, it actually did not provide any additional insight into the atrocity prevention work uh, that, that the Trump administration was doing. The Biden administration's first report um, as required by the Elie Wiesel law um, has come out and it's uh, much more robust, um, but it too requires still some, um, some work. So I, let me just return in closing to Syria uh, again today. You know, we might ask, what if any difference, you know, will these new atrocity prevention laws, um, one of which is specifically about this country, uh, make? And I would say that, you know, amid the current extremely partisan era in U.S. politics, you know, I think it's at least a symbolic achievement that the U.S. Uh, government um, supported overwhelmingly and bipartisanly um, both of these, these laws. They, these laws codified, uh, you know, principles, policies, and procedures that signify how clear and objective atrocity prevention has become even among ardent political opponents. Nevertheless, uh, certainly it's too early to tell how meaningfully uh, the unprecedented yet imperfect laws will actually contribute to mitigating atrocity crimes. A wide gulf has, has always existed between the rhetoric and reality of US policy on atrocity prevention. And that was you know, demonstrated through Samantha Power's uh, book and you know, declarations, infrastructure, training, studies, technical assistance, and reports, which are all you know required by these laws, are helpful. But the U.S. government's will to act is is really what's essential. So, in theory, these two laws hold great potential to relieve suffering and to reinforce security. But in practice, they may prompt major, minor, or to be frank, even no change. And even if advancements the laws lead to are ultimately dramatic. They may only be aspirational and incremental for now, and they certainly were only uh, in that way under the Trump administration. Legislators, I think, especially the bill's sponsors, um, must closely monitor and, and where, necess where necessary advocate for relevant appropriations and fulfillment of the law's letter and spirit. 
And if the executive branch neglects these decrees, I think Congress should take further measures to compel comp compliance. I think American values, interests, and leadership require such vigilance. But thank you very much again for hosting me today. And I very much look forward to engaging with you and with Professor Garule. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaufman. And uh, without further ado, and in the interest of time, I'll turn on to Professor Kugule for his remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Mark. I'd like to, uh, you know, first thank uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Kaufman, for a very, uh, a very comprehensive report, a very interesting report. I'd like to also thank you on the the work that you uh, that you were engaged in in um, in assisting the passage of this uh, the, these two bills, the um, and, and and again I, I I would say that 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 I agree with the, with several of the the points that you made at the conclusion of your of your remarks. You said that this is a symbolic achievement, and that with respect to whether it's going to achieve the intended goal of actually preventing atrocity crimes is going to depend on the government's will to act. And I think you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to serve uh, as a presidential appointee in, in two administrations. And um, I'm very familiar with legislation that requires studies that requires reports, that establishes working groups, that establishes task force, you know, creates task forces. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, with respect to all of this busy activity, you know, the question is, is it really gonna make a difference? Is it really going to achieve the, the intended goal and, and, and purpose uh, of the legislation? Because I've learned that simply being active, you know, doing stuff, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to accomplish the, uh, the intended objectives. And so while I think that it's important that this legislation has drawn attention to atrocity crimes and the fact and, and a recognition that they threaten U.S. national security, I think that's important. You know, there's no question about it on that point. But whether or not uh, these two acts are going to serve the, the intended purpose of uh, of reducing atrocities, uh, including genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes globally, I have to admit that I'm uh, that I'm somewhat somewhat skeptical, to uh, to say the least. And the reason why it, it's it strikes me that that perhaps the U.S. government's policy with respect to the prevention of atrocity crimes is is somewhat schizophrenic. So here on the one hand, you know, the, these two acts are speaking to uh, the importance of preventing uh, these kinds of atrocities and, um, you know, how, how severe, I mean, in terms of the seriousness of these international crimes and the impact on, on humanity, the impact on the, on the global community. But on the other hand, uh, I look at the, at the U.S. government's policies, both uh, Republican and, and Democratic, and, and I have concerns. I think, uh, for example, if the United States were really serious about preventing atrocities, it would um, demonstrate that commitment by doing several things. Let me just highlight three. You know, one would be to, uh, to join the International Criminal Tribunal to sign the Rome Treaty. I mean, the International Criminal Tribunal has jurisdiction over these atrocity crimes. And um, the US being an outsider, not supporting this important international organization, I think uh, speaks volumes with respect to its true you know, commitment to preventing uh, atrocity crimes. Uh, of course, we know that that's uh, practically, it, it, it's, it's just not gonna happen from a practical political perspective. There isn't bilateral support for joining the ICC. So then perhaps the next step would be, well, could the United States assist the ICC in facilitating some of these investigations and prosecutions of individuals that are uh, alleged to have uh, committed these atrocity crimes? 
But apparently the United States is, isn't even willing to go that far to assist the ICC. In fact, it's done, done just the opposite. It's actually condemned the ICC. And when the ICC and the Afghanistan situation initiated an investigation against the United States for atrocities, specifically war crimes committed in Afghanistan, the Trump administration's response was to impose sanctions on the, on the ICC, uh, including the prosecutor of the ICC for investigating these atrocity crimes. So that's my concern about this, this split personality, the, the schizophrenic personality about, yeah, we're, we're in favor of preventing atrocity crimes, but on the other hand, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and impose uh, and create obstacles and um, uh, to make it more difficult for the ICC to, uh, to engage uh, its important work to prevent these atrocity crimes. And then thirdly, uh, I think that, uh, okay, if, if, if the United States doesn't want to recognize or acknowledge the, the jurisdiction of the ICC, the, the credibility of the ICC as an international institution, then perhaps the United States could agree on its own to investigate some of these offenses, utilizing what you refer to, Professor Kaufman, as universal jurisdiction. So crimes against humanity, certainly um, genocide is a universal crime. And um, uh, I think it's well settled that uh, it's recognized as a crime against all humanity, a crime against the international community. And so the United States would be on very firm ground if it sought to exercise a universal jurisdiction to hold uh, the offenders in, in, in Myanmar and in Sudan and other, other countries where there have been um, um, credible evidence of uh, genocide being committed, crimes against humanity being committed. But apparently the, the, the United States uh, doesn't have the, the political will uh, or interest in, in pursuing these crimes and prosecuting them domestically. And again, doesn't appear to be uh, supportive of the ICC's efforts uh, either. And then, so lastly, I, I would think that, that, that at least the United States could be a very outspoken critic of governments that, that, that support and, and are responsible for, for committing these types of atrocity crimes, but, but largely the US's voice is, is muted and it doesn't utilize the, uh, the forum that it has to, uh, to condemn these types of offenses as broadly, as loudly, as, uh, as aggressively as, as it could. And, and so I think you know, the failure of the US to take these types of actions really raises serious questions about its commitment to atrocity prevention. And so while I, I certainly am, am somewhat encouraged by this legislation, these, these two acts, I think it's a step in the right direction. I think ultimately that, that the US's track record in this area is just so, so negative that it, it, it really raises questions about uh, the US's true commitment uh, to preventing uh, atrocity, uh, atrocity crimes. And so uh, at the end of the day, um, again, as I stated, I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but I think that the US has such a terrible track record with respect to prevention of atrocity crimes that, that I seriously question the credibility of, um, of our political leaders on, uh, on uh, both sides of the aisle with respect to their seriousness about, um, about doing something substantively and seriously about preventing uh, atrocity crimes. And then the last point that I would make is that uh, it seems to me that, that all three branches uh, share some blame here. And so with respect to the executive branch, you know, we've seen the executive branch's response to atrocity crimes, and that's imposing economic sanctions under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act uh, against um, the ICC. With respect to the legislative branch, I don't think there is a, any reasonable likelihood that, that the Senate would, would ratify the Rome Treaty if President Biden sought to, uh, 
to if he signed the treaty and, and sought to have it ratified by, by Congress. And then lastly, uh, with respect to the judicial branch, I think the judicial branch has been hostile, at least to principles of international law. And the Judge Kavanaugh in particular, who basically takes the view regarding international law, it's fine unless we uh, and unless Congress enacts legislation or the the executive branch acts inconsistent with international law. Uh, in such case, it can be disregarded. It can be largely disregarded by uh, by the government. So I just think we have such a poor track record here that uh, that I have to uh, have to remain uh, a skeptic. But I'll uh, I'll stop my comments there and. And again, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Gorle. And um, now we turn to the public for uh, the questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Okay, Anshu, please say uh, who you are and <laughs> state your question, please. Am I audible? Professor Kaufman, can you hear me? Yes, I'm Anshu. I'm a lawyer from India pursuing LLM in human rights. Here. So uh, the question regarding the word use of word national security, I was uh, sitting in one of the other seminars here and uh, it was regarding uh, national security and environmental issues. And uh, the heated debate was about the, the moral position, unlike, unlike trying to couch everything in the language of national security, here, genocide or, or atrocities all over the world is a moral and ethical issue. And when you try to use the national security word, Say, say crimes against humanity is happening in a country and say, say a, a, a ethnicity of people, say numbering in 10,000 or something is being killed and it doesn't affect the national security of the United States. So you won't have any interest in that. What, what do you think? Like, like, shouldn't it be a more like a moral issue that United States will take an interest, even if it's not a national security issue for us? Well, thank you for your, for your question. I 100% agree with you. Um, so here, here's, here's, I think, what the, the situation. Um, certainly, as you're pointing out, there are lots of atrocity crimes that may have no national security connection to uh, the United States or many other countries. Um, the, the atrocity crime that I've been specializing in studying for the last 20 years, uh, the Rwandan genocide would be one of them. Um, there was very little connection whatsoever to the U.S. government. And so I completely agree with you that the, that atrocity crime should be primarily thought of, I think, as, as a humanitarian, as a moral, as an ethical uh, concern. Um, and that because we are all human and we, you know, these are, this is the, the worst, you know, type of crime that can be committed against fellow humans. The reason I think that even some, um, you know, people who would, who agree with that statement still want to characterize um, atrocity crimes as a threat to national uh, security is because they know that there are many politicians and many, many members of the American public that want to understand um, and will only unfortunately buy into issues that have a connection to, to the US. Um, it's, it's just a sad reality of, of politics um, in, in this country, as well as I'm sure many countries around the world. And so what I think that the Obama administration and the Albright Cohen report were trying to do in pointing out ways in which atrocity crimes are not only a moral concern, but also threaten national security, was to try to appeal to both perspectives. They didn't say it's, you know, or they were, they said, and they said, you know, atrocity crimes are a moral, uh, you know, concern, a core morals concern, as well as a core national security uh, interest. And so I think that, I think that that's what's sort of going on. I, I agree with you. The morality side is what most matters, especially as you point out again, that, that there are some atrocity crimes that couldn't plausibly be linked to the U.S. government um, or the U.S., you know, homeland. Um, but uh, it's just the, the sad reality of politics, I think, in the United States. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Simba. I'm doing the LLM here in Notre Dame. Uh, so, you know, like, you know, I hear people talking about, you know, the U.S. Uh, wanting to do this and, 
like Professor uh, Guruli mentioned that, well, maybe they can at least assist the ICC, but they're not even willing to go there. You know, when I look at this entire, you know, thing about the US, you know, a country like France, for instance, signed the Rome Statute on the very day that it came into force, right? So, I mean, I feel like the US has lost all moral authority to even talk about this. Like, I mean, it's either you in or you out. So if you're not gonna go by what everyone else is doing, you probably should just not do anything because this starts to seem to me like some form of, you know, hypocrisy in, in a view. And, you know, like, I mean, I hate to be blunt, but I don't think the US still has the moral authority to even do this because some other countries are serious. They're on the ground. The U.S. is just talking. So to me, it's, it's sort of even kind of insulting. And I, I think the U.S. really needs to step up. We, we can talk about the politics and all that, but the bottom line is that you say that you're in or you're out. And at this point, the U.S., whether you know, Republicans or Democrats, are out. So that should really be a debate. Uh, and, you know, as you can tell, I'm, I'm, I'm really frustrated by this because the world does expect more from the U.S., but up to this point, the U.S. has really failed. Um, I share your frustration. Uh, I really do. Um, and I think that Samantha Power's book, you know, shows in, in very painful detail all of these inconsistencies and hypocrisies throughout the last couple of centuries, um, including atrocities that have been perpetrated by Americans in the United States uh, as well, I, I would add. Um, just to, I, I think I would like to add a few um, details to, to the um, the, the U.S. engagement with the International Criminal Court, just just because I think it to kind of um, make this a little bit more complicated. So wh while it certainly is the case that the United States has not ratified the Rome Statute and has demonstrated outright hostility, you know, mostly um, most recently in the Trump administration by imposing sanctions um, on uh, the prosecutor and her um, and one of her lead uh, staff members. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure I agree that it's fair to say that the United States has not assisted the, the International Criminal Court in, in any way. And, and let me give you a few examples. So the Bush administration um, and the Obama administration, I would argue, actually did assist the ICC in a couple of different ways. Number one, in 2005, the United States government abstained when the UN Security Council referred Darfur to the ICC. It could have vetoed, but it didn't, it abstained. And that allowed the, um, the case to be referred by the Security Council to the ICC. Um, fast forward six years to 2011, a vote came before the UN Security Council where again, the US could have vetoed. And instead of not vetoing, and instead of not even abstaining, the United States government voted in favor of referring Libya to the ICC. So there are, are two cases in which the United States has either not hurt or has actually proactively helped um, certain cases to be referred to the ICC. In addition, um, the United States really was critical in transferring at least two suspects to the ICC for prosecution. And those were Bosco and Taganda and Dominic uh, Anguin. So Bosco and Ngongwen, Bosco and Taganda walked into the U.S. Embassy in Rwanda and was transferred to the International Criminal Court. The United States government facilitated the transfer of one of its primary suspects to the ICC. And then finally, I would say, I mentioned that the, the Rewards for Justice program, this bounty hunting program that authorizes up to millions of dollars for information leading to the capture or arrest of certain suspected atrocity perpetrators. Um, in recent years, that, uh, that law has been revised to include uh, any individual who is wanted by an international court, including the International Criminal Court. And so there, there are at least three ways in which the US government is, I would argue, even though it has refused to ratify the Rome Statute, is helping, or at least not hurting, uh, the ICC. Certainly things were the worst ever under the Trump administration, but they were a little bit better in the two prior administrations, one a Republican and one a Democratic administration. And in the Biden administration, it actually uh, might thaw uh, as well. Already the sanctions uh, have, been, have been dropped. Um, so I think just a fuller picture, I think what it you know, acknowledges um, those, those ways. But 
that, that does nothing to change the perspective, the, the point that you're making, of course, that the U.S. government has not ratified the, the statute and therefore has not fully engaged with the permanent infrastructure um, on the ICC. Now, we could debate different aspects of the International Criminal Court um, that might that that do give both Democrats and Republicans pause. Um, but at the end of the day, you're absolutely right that this is the primary uh, tool that is used to promote accountability for atrocity prevention, and the U.S. is not a party to it. Final point on the ICC. Um, you know, when we talk about signature ratification of the Rome Statute as indicating cooperation and participation in this tool, I would urge you to consider that there are many reasons why states, um, you know, would sign on to any international law or ratify any international law beyond sincere desire to cooperate and to play by the rules. Already, there are several signatories to the Rome Statute um, who have withdrawn or have said that they're just not going to cooperate uh, with the Rome Statute. And so I, what I would, I guess, urge everybody to consider is that signature or ratification of the Rome Statute does not necessarily mean uh, full buy-in and cooperation with uh, the underlying principles and practices of international criminal justice. Thank you, Professor Kaufman. We have one I, last question. Uh, yeah. Can I quickly yeah. respond? Yeah. So... I think it's, it's somewhat of a very sad testament that over the last 20 years, that has been the extent of the U.S.'s cooperation with the ICC. I mean, just think about that. They, they abstained from, from referring Darfur, Sudan, to the ICC. They abstained. They couldn't even go so far as to refer that matter. And then Libya, they, 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 they refer to that matter. And then they transferred two suspects. That's it in 20 years. I mean, that, that, that's all we can highlight in terms of the U.S.'s cooperation. That's, that, that's a terrible it testament is. regarding our, our, our support and assistance. And, and so I, I don't know that that's something that I would highlight. And, and then we offset that with the fact that President George W. Bush unsigned the, uh, the, the Rome uh, Treaty Agreement. And then most recently, Senator or Secretary of State Pompeo has just been such a vocal, uh, a, just negative, harsh critic uh, uh, of the ICC, just condemning it at every turn of the corner. So, so we're, we're on the back end of this. The United States, if, if we're going to be true to our values of promoting human rights and the defender of human rights, we should be on the front end of this, not on the back end. We're not leading, we're following. And that's what's very sad about this situation. We should be leading this effort. We should be in, in, inside the ICC, shaping, strengthening this institution for, to ensure accountability of these most serious of, of international crimes. But instead, we're in the back end following rather than leading. And that's, uh, that's very unfortunate. Thank you, Professor Gole. Um, we have one last question in one minute. We have one minute left. <laughs> um, so my question is related to the Global, the Global Fragility Act that I believe was passed in 2019, and I was just curious if um, if you had it, or Dr. Kaufman, if you. I, I can barely hear. I'm, I'm not sure. I bet uh, Professor Kaufman's having some difficulty as well. I so. can't hear. I can't hear. Could you speak louder, please? The student. <clears throat> Go ahead. Can, can you hear me now? What are you go, come up from? Please. <laughs> you go? Okay, can you hear me here? Yes, good. So my question's related, this is going back to Dr. Kaufman's legislative experience, um, to the Global Fragility Act that was passed in 2019. I was just curious if that was something that you worked on or if that was kind of passed in like conjunction with this other wave of legislation that you worked on and um, how that affects mass atrocity prevention. Thank you. Um, there, there really has been kind of a suite of, um, of legislation that, that has been 
uh, published, you know, enacted around atrocity issues. I would also mention the Global Magnitsky Act um, as well as that's a, another way to, um, to hold human rights offenders uh, accountable. The, Gro the Global Fragility Act was something that was sort of buzzing around when I was uh, working in Congress, but um, as you mentioned, 2019, it really came to the fore uh, a little later. So um, I have colleagues that, that, that worked on that, um, you know, obviously to success and, uh, and did a great, great job. Um, and I think what, what, you know, sort of the point here is that there, this has actually been a momentous time for a variety of human rights uh, legislation. Um, but as Professor Garule and others, you know, are pointing out, um, at the end of the day, what's really going to matter is the, the government's will to act. You know, we could pass all the legislation we want on any topic, um, but, but what matters is, is what we actually do. Uh, and, um, and, you know, again, I, I think that on the plus side, this is raising expectations and assumptions about what the U.S. government uh, should do and can do. Um, but um, but whether it will do uh, remains to be to be determined, and that could just it could take years. It could take a you know a generation for things to change. And um, while you know victims of atrocity crimes can't wait that long, um, history is is long. Uh, and, and my hope is that these laws, now that they are law, um, will have a an eventual uh, impact. Thank you so much, Professor Kaufman. Unfortunately, the time is up. Uh, it was a great discussion and uh, students are very uh, interested, but unfortunately we have to leave. And uh, we thank you for uh, your time and thank you also, Professor Gorole. And uh, with that said, uh, I guess we're gonna have to uh, set up another appointment for another lecture. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you to all of you. Thank you to Jean and thank you to Professor Garule and all of the audience. Um, really appreciated being here today uh, and all of your amazing uh, engagement and especially Professor Garule's uh, commentary. So thank you. Bye-bye.